All right. Told you he was coming. Told you he wrote a book. I don't have to even introduce him anymore, Aaron McIntyre. He does a show on The Blaze, but now he's a world-famous author, and he, he really did. He wrote an incredible book called The Total State. He's been on this show many, many, many times talking about this concept, the total state, the total state. He wrote a book about it. So, Aaron, what, what is the total state? Well, Jesse, I think like a lot of people, I saw what happened in 2020, and I was like, why isn't the Constitution, why aren't the Bill of Rights stopping all of this? How are the churches being closed? How is the government taking over all of this power? And as I wrote this book, what I realized is that the government has grown well beyond the boundaries envisioned by the founders. It's not just the three branches. Of course, we know the deep state and all the power that's been moved out of the elected government into these unelected bureaucracies. But it's also grown into the private sector. It's moved into the media. It's moved into corporations and NGOs that have global reach that come in and dictate into the United States how they should run the government. And so what we've really seen is that the total state has assembled itself by growing around the, uh, the limitations on power that were created by the founding fathers in the Constitution. And that's why we feel like we have an increasingly tyrannical government, even though we're supposed to have all these checks and balances that limit, limit the government in the United States. Are on something that hit me during COVID, it hits hit me before, but man, during COVID, it was more evident that at any point in time in my life is how the system, which is what I call it, call it whatever, how they all speak with one voice. You can turn on CNN at night and the anchor is saying one thing. And then the doctor from the CDC is saying this and the FDA is saying that. And the Democrat Republican or the Democrat politician is saying the same thing. And the Republican politician is saying the same thing. They all speak with one voice at all times, and they're almost always lying. It blows me away how coordinated they are. Yeah, that's really the thing that you have to think about, right? In a normal totalitarian state, we would know there would be you know, Joseph Goebbels, or there would be uh, the Politburo in the Soviet Union. There would be someone who has an official job of coordinating the message. But we don't have that in the United States. And so one of the questions I try to answer in the book is, how do we end up with this coordinated total state even though there's not one central like conspiracy running this whole thing. And the answer really is that all of our elite institutions are thinking with the same mind, they're moving with the same morals because they share the same worldview, the same structure about how they should be able to totally rewrite the human being. They think that they have the authority to socially engineer every person in the United States, and they think that they have the authority to rule with this unified idea of what humanity should become. So while there's no top-down conspiracy, everyone goes to the same institutions. They all have the same incentives. They all have the same friends, cocktail parties. They get married to the same class of people, and they share those class interests. And that's what moves them to speak with one voice. Our states, especially our red states, they are the last bastion of freedom on this planet. It's not the country itself. New York isn't a freedom for anything. Texas, that's a place where you can still find it and hopefully find some people who will protect it. We have a good AG here, a great one. Ken Paxson is his name. Mr. Attorney General, he joins me now. Uh, okay, the states themselves, I say that we are in a unique position to fight for freedom because of the state system in this country and because of AGs like yourself who are actually willing to take some risks. What say you? Uh, I think you've got a really good point. It's unusual. I mean, you don't find this in other countries where states actually created the federal government. In other countries, the federal government was created, and then they created the, the states if they have them. Here, it's just the opposite. So the states gave certain powers to the federal government. We reserved the rest to ourselves. So we have an obligation as states to protect ourselves from the federal government taking on too much power, which they they do every day. So that's why we have this opportunity. And if we don't take it, then we will end up with a federal government similar to other countries. Venezuela, you pick it, China. I don't. It's it's going to be similar because their tendency is always to grab more power and more control. Mr. Ag, could you explain what they did to you, Ken? When a lot of people found the timing to be very interesting, given the things you were looking into, and then all of a sudden this completely cockamamie impeachment comes up for you in Texas, which of course got shot down. But it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. We talked about it all the time. And the timing, I sure found the timing to be very interesting. Did you? Uh, yeah, there's no doubt there was no coincidence in the timing. We, first of all, had been very successful in our fight against Joe Biden, stopping these illegal activities 
unconstitutional actions and the destruction of people's lives through open borders and allowing drug trafficking to become prevalent to kill our kids. And so I think the Biden administration sent people here. They, there were two of them working on the Republican committee. Two of the four lawyers came from the Department of Justice. There's no doubt that that was not an accident. Secondly, we have obviously we have lawsuits against Google, Facebook, and other big tech companies. I think they played a hand in this. And I also think the fact that I was announcing an investigation against Pfizer for some of the misleading information that they provided to consumers about the effectiveness of their vaccine. We announced the investigation May 1st. By the end of May, I'm out of office and I can't do anything. And that, that lawsuit, that potential lawsuit dies until I have the opportunity to come back and start up. And then we did sue them. So all of these big companies and these big government cooperatives uh, were involved, I think, involved in making sure that there was a real effort and lots of money behind trying to take me out. Yeah, I think so, too. Could you explain to me why John Cornyn and many like him is a thing in red states in Texas? And I don't just want to pick on our state, obviously, but these people exist across the country. These red states elect these completely useless losers into these gigantic positions, and it hurts us when we should be having senators like you. Instead, we have senators like John Cornyn. Why does this happen in our state? Well, look, John Cornyn is there for one reason. The Bush administ- the Bushes put him there. He w- he did their their bidding when he was uh, on the Texas Supreme Court. He was put by- put there by George W. Bush. And it was to get through something called Robin Hood, where it was wealth redistribution for the schools. Uh, Bush didn't want to do it because he wanted to run for president because it involved a large tax increase and also the transition of money from certain school districts that had more to certain districts that had less. It was complete socialism. And he did it for him, and his reward was to become AG and then become a U.S. senator. And he's continued in that line. Why Why the voters have not replaced him? One is it's expensive to run against a guy like him. And two, you know, he's got, he just has not had real competition. And now he's got a record of 14 years, not only as AG, but I mean, literally 14 years as a senator. And I think it's pretty clear there's nothing good happening for the state of Texas. Do you anticipate uh, any established challenger for him in the primary? I understand he has one coming up in 2026. I'm extremely invested in that. Do you foresee anything on the horizon? Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that he's going to have a more conservative challenger. It's 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 a race that can be won. Um, and I think just highlighting his record is, is pretty much all it takes for the voters of, at least in a primary, to understand that if we're going to have two state senators, we got one really good one, Ted Cruz. Sure, be nice for Texas, one of the more conservative states, to have a similar type senator, which we have failed to have for those 14 years that John Cornyn has served. I think the world's most deliberative body has been reduced to kabuki theater. There's no uncertainty ever. The only time you get to offer an amendment in this place is if it's sure to fail. Think about that. Senator Schumer won't allow United States senators to offer ideas unless he knows they will fail. And how about instead of every hour, maybe you show up, or what what if we sat in our seats and actually voted on this stuff for four or five hours? We could get through a lot, but the senator from New York is allergic to work. The Senate is broken. That's not a very sunny view of what goes on in the Senate, but it is inspiring that we do have a few GOP senators that are worth something. One of the best is Senator Eric Schmidt out of the state of Missouri. I still don't understand. I still don't understand why Missouri produces like these hardcore anti-communist types. What's going on in Texas? Hey, Senator, I would not have pictured Missouri five, ten years ago to produce people like you. And yet you're not the only one there. There's like a bunch. Your new age is a stud, too. What are you guys doing up there? It's the show me state, brother. It's in our DNA. So <laughs> I don't know how you describe it, but we've, uh, it's always been in the, I think the DNA of Missourians is sort of be skeptical of a federal government a thousand miles away telling us how to live our lives. So I, I take that with a, with a badge and honor. Yeah. A healthy dose of skepticism for these people is warranted. Okay. Senator first for, for stupid people like me, explain what you're talking about with the amendment process and the law, that was obviously a speech you were giving in reference to the big foreign aid money laundering scheme that we just passed, of course, in this country like we always do. But what are you talking about, amendments and they don't allow? What's going on? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, you know, I was elected in 2022. I was AG before. So you come here and the, and the Senate's supposed to have this reputation as 
you have free and open debate. There's only 100 senators. You advocate for your position. Maybe you, there's some unique coalition that's formed on some idea that you've got. It's not how it works at all. Chuck Schumer has, you know, essentially put a stranglehold on the process. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, the reason, you know, there are no individual appropriations bills, Jesse. We've got to get back to a place where there's 12 of them. Senators have an opportunity to amend it. It goes to the House. There's some conference committee. You work it out, whatever. We don't do any of that. Instead, because of the allure of the power that comes with it, a couple people in leadership, what they do is they wait till a deadline. They don't allow input. They come down from on high and unveil some omnibus monstrosity at, you know, at, the, at, at 10 minutes to midnight and say, you know, read this or don't read it. And if you don't support it, you support a government shutdown or some other nonsense, right? It's, it's really a, um, a, a terrible way to do this. And it really boxes out 96 or 97 other voices along the way. And so I've been an advocate for reform. Let's open it up. Even if it's, you know, what people consider tough votes, that's what we get paid for, right? We get paid here. We get we get sent here uh, to come here and advocate. And people can judge us by our records. But a lot of people are afraid, I think, of taking these tough votes. Chuck Schumer wants to control the agenda exclusively. Uh, and he's getting away with it. And so I felt compelled to go on the floor and call it out. I'm really sad to say none of that is surprising at all. Senator, from from afar, you know, from the outside looking in, it, uh, our debt crisis is coming. Everyone knows. I mean, it's already here. P grocery prices are up 40%. They're not going back down. Everyone knows that. No one's even pretending they're going back down. We're watching our way of life disappear, and these scumbags you work with in D.C. just appear to be, what, clearing out the vault on their way out? That's what it looks like. That We're just looting the Treasury now? That's all we do? Well, it's a complete disconnect, Jesse, from real America. Um, that's just sort of been my experience. Uh, the the priorities here in Washington are not connected to what real Americans face every single day, right? Um, the reason, you know, inflation isn't some natural disaster, right? There's a formula for it. It turns out if you spend trillions and trillions of dollars you don't have and you declare a war on domestic energy production, the cost of everything goes up. And people feel it every time they're at the grocery store. So when Joe Biden goes on the campaign trail and talks about this ridiculous Bidenomics, it's not selling. When we come up here and you want to send, you know, $180 billion to secure Ukraine's border when we haven't done anything uh, to secure our own border, it's just a complete disconnect. And so I, I'm just I think you got to come to this place. Uh, to tell it like it is, be, you know, have a real dose of reality and fight for reform because we need it, Jesse, as a country. I think the people that get it understand uh, the place that we're at. The left is playing for keeps. Um, they want to censor Americans. I mean, talk about the real threats to democracy. They're trying to imprison their political opponent. If this were happening in any other part of the world, uh, our State Department will be warning people. But you know, again, it doesn't get the attention it deserves on the Senate floor where we actually do legislate and we don't do any of those things. Instead, we wait till deadlines and then people get presented these omnibus bills, which are a disaster. Senator, is there any appetite or is there getting to be an appetite to change GOP leadership? And I don't mean swapping out Mitch McConnell for some elephant turd like John Cornyn or John Thune. I mean, really getting rid of these old types who ruin us and replacing them with people who believe in freedom and want to be the believe in sound money, believe the things you believe. I, I, I mean, it's one thing to dump Mitch McConnell. What do I get when we dump McConnell and bring me John Cornyn? I get the same loser I had there before. Is there any appetite to change this? Can we change it? Well, look, I think um, one of the problems, you know, I think too many people look to Washington, D.C. for all the answers, right? The truth is, right? The real Americans in real America understand that that's got to come from their families and their community. Um, I say that not to like pass the buck in any way, because you're right. No. We need to have a, a leadership in Washington that understands what the American people are going through, that is connected. I grew up in a working class family, you know, so I trust me, I understand um, what, what people are, are struggling with right now, why they want Washington to respond to that. But I think that... Um, um, as, as conservatives, understanding that Washington, D.C. doesn't have the answers for a lot of the big issues. These are big cultural issues in many ways that you talk a lot about on your show. And so but as relates to Senate leadership, um, you know, we're going to have a unique opportunity now. It, it doesn't come along very often to have a new leader. Um, uh, and so I think we're going to take the Senate back. I think the map works really well for us. Uh, hopefully the House holds it and hopefully Donald Trump becomes president. And then we got to do something with it. Right. Like. 
I think people get tired of all these promises on the campaign trail and people come to Washington. They're just a rubber stamp for business as usual. It's certainly not why I ran. It's not how I want to conduct myself. So there's going to be a lot of tough conversations, I think, of making sure our agenda lines up with where the people are at. And I think with a lot of frustration, people feel, at least back home in Missouri, and I'm sure it's true in a lot of other places, is that, hey, look, we send people there, but it doesn't feel like anything changes in our lives, right? And I think part of that too is this the growth of the administrative state. We've got to fundamentally dismantle the administrative state so that these faceless bureaucrats and agencies people have never heard of stop making decisions that affect people's lives and their freedoms. How do we do that? I mean, we can make this about the FBI, but it could be about any of them, IRS, CIA, NSA. These organizations have never been brought to heel in my 42 years on this planet. And if we don't bring them to heel now, they're going to end this country. I really believe that, Senator. They have the ability to end this country. But Congress, you know, Congress, you guys are the only one who can do it. If there's no appetite to defund them or whatnot, then what? We're just screwed and I have to bank on my county sheriff fighting the FBI? Yeah, no, you're right. Listen, the way that we we have to approach this from the Article One branch has to reassert itself uh, and take control and uh, and and again dismantle this 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 behemoth that's been created over the years. You know, when I was Attorney General, we brought the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit. I think that was a big important step. The Supreme Court's going to rule on that that vast censorship enterprise that was created uh, by the Biden administration to silence dissent. Uh, hopefully, they rule the right way. But no matter what, it's exposed. I think. Um, you know, again, an Orwellian scheme um, to crush dissent in this country. We can't allow it. But to answer your question, how do we go about it? Well, there's there's two things that are happening. There is a case in front of the Supreme Court. Again, this is I don't want to get too nerdy on this, but the Chevron deference is this decades old precedent that essentially allows these agencies deference and the courts yield to their quote unquote expertise. And I think we've seen how flawed the quote unquote experts really are. But if they overturn that, it provides an opening uh, and a real opportunity. And also something I've advocated for is for every new regulation that these bureaucrats want to issue to any pullback three uh, in, in something called the RAINS Act, where if they've got a new rule or regulation, Jesse, that, that has an economic impact of pick your number, mine would be extremely low, but you could have a debate about that, that Congress would actually have to vote on it right? Judge us by our votes. So if you want to ban gas stoves, agency we've never heard of, that actually have, that's your new, that's your proposed rule. It goes to Congress and we vote that yes, up or down. And I think that would get rid of most of this nonsense. It would also expose the people who are totally fine with what we've seen, you know, with the Ministry of State and the abuses. Yeah, I like it. Senator, appreciate you very much. I hope you're there for a while, sir. Appreciate it. One of the good ones. Former National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, pleaded guilty today to lying to the FBI. He was one of the most respected generals in the military. He was, by definition, the most dangerous possible person for Donald Trump to hire. Only brilliant military career serving 33 years. Why was he being so elusive? Mike Flynn told the truth and faced life in prison. Does my heart well to see the general back out there still fighting for it. Joining me now, General Michael Flynn has this movie out, which I would highly recommend, FlynnMovie.com. Go tune in. General, it's an honor, sir. For people who are not aware of your career, everyone knows your name by now. You are infamous, yeah. as they would say. But for those who don't know about your career, <laughs> what is your background before you hooked up with the President Trump? Yeah, my background was uh, really... Um, 33, just over 33 years in the Army. I spent uh, five years in direct combat operations overseas, everything from uh, Central America, the Caribbean, Central Asia, uh, of course, the Middle East and places like Iraq. Uh, spent some time on uh, six continents. Uh, I have uh, served in the Airborne, uh, 82nd Airborne Division. I've served in Special Operations Forces. And I've served in uh, at some of the most senior levels in the military, uh, to include rising to the uh, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the most senior uh, military intelligence officer in the Department of Defense. And uh, that particular position, I was chosen by Barack Obama himself. And um, so I, I uh, had a really great career. Uh, I loved serving in the military. I was born on a military base, Jesse. 
My father uh, served in World War II in Korea. Both of my grandparents served in World War I. One of my grandfathers served in World War I and World War II. And really since World War II, uh, with the exception of probably the Bay of Pigs, and we have had a Flynn serving in every every conflict or every war since World War I. So that's the story of my family and a, a, a part of my story uh, in service to country in uh, uniform. And then, of course, I made the huge mistake of getting involved in politics, <laughs> right, with, this, <laughs> with this, uh, har- these horrible people that are involved in politics. My God. And uh, But I did. I did because I... There's one thing that I that I firmly believe in and I saw happening to our country because I'm a student of history, world history and U.S. history. And I am a uh, you know, I've been in the world. I've been in the um, intelligence field for a long time. So I've studied many, many uh, of our adversaries and our opponents overseas. And and I never thought, as I state in the movie, I never thought that the worst enemy that I'd ever face would be right here at home. But uh, what has happened is we we have um, we have allowed ourselves to become complacent and lazy in this country, Jesse, and that's that's every American, frankly, and I include myself in there. And we have just let these politicians run roughshod over our country for the last fifty years, really since post World War II. Um, everything, I mean, everything from taking over our education system, taking over our law enforcement, taking over our healthcare systems. I mean, every single aspect of who we are as a nation and what we're supposed to be as a as a society based on a set of values and principles. And we just lost sight of all of that. And and that's the real message in this movie. The movie is a is a it's a phenomenal movie. I mean, it's you know, I I'm I'm, I'm humbled by the feedback. I I worked very hard with my uh, team of people, uh, the producer of this movie, Scott Wiper who was a Hollywood guy, actually, I, you know, I looked very high and low for the right person to do this, to tell this story. And I didn't want somebody sort of on the conservative documentary side. I wanted somebody who really, you know, saw me from afar and, but was a good storyteller. And, and I found the right guy. It took me about three years to, to actually discover uh, the, this, this uh, a director, producer, Scott Wiper, and he's not really well known in Hollywood. He's done some, he did the big ugly and some other action films, but he's a, he's a great uh, person. And he was sort of in the, the, the left, not, not, not progressive crazy left, but he was on the left side of, of life in terms of political ideolo- ideology. And I wanted him to bring his team. And it was, we worked hard to get that team here because Hollywood would not, you know, they did not want to have this, this uh, group of guys and gals telling this story and so they felt a lot of pressure, but they told it. And with my family, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but there's a really intimate portrayal inside of my family in this movie. And it really shows the strength uh, and the resilience of a family when the family bonds together what they can, what they can do, you know, what they can achieve. And like my sister Mary says toward the end of the movie, you know, if the Flynn's can fight this darkness out of our lives, then the American people can bond together and and fight this darkness that we're facing right now out of our lives here in America, because we're facing darkness. We're facing dark times, folks, if we don't get our act together. And this movie is a portrayal of the, of the corruption that we face, that I face, certainly, but we all face. And people, and I'll finish with this part, Jesse, people come up to me all the time and thank me for my service. And I'm so appreciative of that. And I, I'm humbled by it. But I turn around to people and I tell them, how are, you know, how are you serving today? What are you doing to serve this country? And the other thing is that people tell me that they're sorry for what happened to me. And I tell people, look, I'm not sorry for myself. I don't stand as a, I've never, I've never been a kid that was, that was taught to feel sorry for yourself. It's, you know, you get knocked down, get back up. But I, what I tell people is I feel sorry for what they did to the American people and what they did to the United States of America, because when they, when they came after me, and they took me out, they left a huge, huge vacuum uh, for Donald Trump to fill, and he never was able to fill it. And I think he found himself kind of like I say in the movie, I felt I was a little bit of a, 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 you know, a lone man on an island by myself. I think Donald Trump actually felt that way at times while he was, while he was uh, uh, d- during his presidency. 
And I know that he feels that way now because he, although he might feel like the American people are behind him, believe me, there are times, there are going to be moments when he's alone and he's thinking to himself, can I get through this? Trust me. I mean, he's a human being and uh, as I am. And, uh, and, and what we're facing is we're facing an ungodly amount of, uh, of evil that has permeated the fabric of the United States of America. And we're the last bastion. I say, you know, I use a, a military term. We're the last redoubt of defense of freedom. And if we don't get this, we don't get these next six months right, Jesse. And you've been you've been at the forefront of this. We don't get these next six months right. Uh, we're going to we're going to find ourselves calling, you know, the United States of America, the United Socialist States of America, because we're heading to a, a and, and socialism is probably too soft probably too soft of a word because what this, what some of these people represent. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, it's enough of, of an opening no. for you. No, that's, that's, that's everything I needed, General. I want people to go get the specifics, find out just how dirty and evil this corrupt government has become. I want people to go to FlynnMovie.com, watch it, General. I have so much respect for you, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. FlynnMovie.com, all right? Psychopath Democrat, the mentally ill single woman at home on 15 anti-anxiety medications, sits there and looks at all her cats and says, oh my God, Trump's never going to leave. She believes it. The mentally ill single woman is the beating heart of the Democrat Party. Everyone listening or watching right now knows a woman in their life. Her eyes are half bugged out of her skull. She ruins Thanksgiving every time bragging about her 15th abortion. Everyone, everyone, everyone knows a woman like this. I know you, you're laughing because I know you do, Megan. Everyone knows one. I, I can think of her right now. I can just, I can picture her in my mind. I wonder if she's seen that clip yet. Anyway, joining me now, Jennifer Gilardi, culture, health, and policy writer. And in fact, we had her on before, and we had her on to talk about the awesome piece that she wrote. We never even freaking got to it last time. She wrote a piece called Hell Hath No Fury Like a Single Liberal Woman. <laughs> That's such a great headline. Jennifer, what are you talking about in there? Oh, I think they're very upset. They're very angry. Um, and, you know, to be a little compassionate, why? I try not Why are they angry? Um, well, they've been kind of sold a bill of goods, I think, with the feminist movement. I know I was. Um, it is a little bit of cultish. The tactics are like a cult, I think, on the progressive left. They, they kind of dismantle, we know that word, um, what did they call it, with religion, where you have to, like, disassemble and question everything, which is good, but the rebuilding phase is not so great. So they kind of pull you away from family. They dig up trauma or any kind of your past that may disaffect you from your family. And then they instill these other values that I believe are anti-family, anti-Western, anti-Christian. Um, and I see we're, we're seeing that play out. I think the, what we're seeing on college campuses, we see many of these young students are women who have been brainwashed and some of them don't even know what they're arguing for right they we've seen that clip of the two girls going do you know what do you actually know what this is about and she's like no i don't i think i need to do my research you're like yeah you need to do your research you need to know if you're going to be violent and angry what you're violent and angry about um but i also think what i see in their like eyes and their soul like somebody has ripped their soul out of their body is what it looks like to me and I see that with a lot of these women, they're kind of, I, I don't know, they're lost and they're looking. And so they get trapped into this, they fall into this trap of the progressive kind of cult movement and they get retrained um, to, I think, hate their bodies in a way, their their own biology, um, the thing that makes them a woman, the, the beautiful thing that makes them a woman, whether they choose to go down that path or not, which is procreation. Um, we see our own administration uh, kind of vilifying that by saying, well, it doesn't really matter. We're going to allow men in your locker room. We don't care what you think. <laughs> do you do you get the strain that they hate their country as well? Because obviously we know how it manifests. They, it manifests itself. They turn out to be loyal little street communists who go throw poop on people and do the things that Democrats want them to do. But is there an anti-America thing or is it just anti-family, anti-men? What do they what do they hate? I think you can't separate those two. I think if you there's part partly part of it is a self-hatred that gets projected out onto the world. And then they've been given someone to blame, which is 
typically white men right this is the reason for your problems you're pushed down you don't get an opportunity the glass ceiling is is real and i mean i get that conversation maybe 60 years ago um but women are in the workforce and they take prominent spots in medical schools i don't see it as still a valid argument and so now i find women just want something to whine about a lot of a lot of the times um and the left gives them a good excuse. Oh, it's it's the patriarchy. It is toxic masculinity. Look at all these examples of the Harvey Weinstein. Sure, of course, there's always gonna be bad men, but as a whole, we are not a bad country. Men aren't terrible. Who's gonna build the roads? You wanna go do it? You want You want women? You wanna go down in the streets and in the manholes and do all that kind of work? I mean, Camille Paglia is such a good, wonderful academic mind in this space who is pretty asexual. I think she's, if she's not a lesbian, she's just, she, it's, it has nothing to do with her sex. She just sees common sense and the writing on the wall. Um, but again, the left have, they're angry about their own life. And then they've been given excuse to kind of project and a lot of kind of venues and pathways to project that out into the world. Um, and one of them is, is what we're seeing on college campuses, right? That's what, what's happening, I don't think, is so much even anti-Semitism. We just had a meeting about this here in D.C. I'm on a task force. And it's not anti-Semitism, really. They don't even really, I think, know the history of the Middle East, a lot of them. It's anti-Western. It's anti-Christian. This is just the new BLM. Um, and it happens to be a lot of women that are joining the movement. You, I don't, again, they've been whether it's the woke mind virus, I think it's, um, they don't like themselves as women. Are, now, you obviously, I need to give everyone, everyone a little background. Jennifer used to be one, right? So she knows what she's talking about here. Now, this may or may not apply to you, but do you, do you get the impression there was a parenting failure somewhere? I'm not saying they all had bad parents or something like that. Maybe they did all have bad parents, but did you get the impression that dad failed these ladies at some point or mom failed these ladies or it just is, you know, society is what it is. Young women are impressionable. You go off to college, you come back a nutball. Did you get the impression there's parenting failure here? I do. And I think what my generation has done, I am Gen X. I think we've overcorrected for the distant parent, um, for the father that wasn't around, right? That, that whose job it was to just go to work and bring in money and support the family financially without maybe being there for the girls in the way little girls need, which is to be adored, to be loved, to be cherished. And if little girls don't have that growing up, if they don't feel their daddy loves them, right? And is there for them, I think they're gonna go look for that out in the world. And that, that happened to be a little bit of my scenario. My dad was a great dad. He he provided, he paid my way through undergraduate university. He just wasn't around a lot. And and so I think one, I was, I, the other thing I point to is like the, the nature of women, right? We tend to be more nurturing, compassionate. And I think the left takes advantage of that. And I was very sensitive child. And I felt people for people in pain and I don't like to see people in pain. So the left does a good job on pulling those heartstrings, but I was also looking for like a daddy, I was looking for a father figure in my life. And I fell into kind of cultish sort of yoga groups and spirituality groups and all those things you hear about in like Los Angeles in the West, they're there. And I think whether it's conscious or unconsciously, they prey on women with insecurities who um, are just unsure of themselves. And I see this in, like I said, the call it, I wrote another piece about kind of the appearance of these college protesters and what they look like. They're not particularly attractive. They are wearing clothes that I've just, you know, they, it's like they have no concern for their appearance at all or their health. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I don't want to interrupt, but actually I wanted to ask you on that point, Jennifer, why yeah. are they, and I'm really not trying to be as insulting as I normally am, why are they, why are so many of them fat and or ugly? Is it a chicken or the egg thing? Is this a young lady who maybe has felt the rejection of men, the rejection of society, and so she's found other women in that same place? 
Or is it so many years of bitterness? I mean, bitterness ages you worse than a carton a day of Marlboro Reds. What is yeah. it that that does that? I'm not. I'm really genuinely not trying to be mean, but you look at one of these feminist rallies. It's not exactly a bunch of women that look like you. It's just not. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and and I wrote about this and kind of um and yeah, and that piece in the Federalist, the beginning of it was, you know. I, I'm not on the exactly the ugly side of the scale, but I did have a lot of insecurities about how I looked because I was in front of the camera. So I was always worried about how I looked and my appearance and not fitting into my business, which was in Hollywood, which was um, in the fitness business. So I always felt like I needed to be thinner and I needed to look a certain way according to society standards. I mean, I do think that that's there. So there's gotta be a balance between putting beautiful women on the cover and that's okay because we appreciate beauty and we wanna see those things and then telling little girls that they all have to look like that, right? That this is, that this is taking care of yourself is a good, it is a It is a virtue. We want to be healthy. We want to work with the gifts that God has given us and the body that God has given us. We, but we don't have to all look like supermodels. But when we don't look like supermodels, let's cultivate the other virtues in us, whether that's our intelligence, our artistic our abilities, or our, you know, whatever it might be that make us powerful. And we're still women. We still have the biological tendencies of women to nurture and be compassionate. I think women play such a big role in this. And if we can find women that are truly empowered in their own biology and the power of being the life-giving sex, um, then we can, and, and not and not kind of project our, any, anger or any kind of frustration or disappointment we have from failed relationships, whatever they may be onto the world, we really have a chance to change the society, change the culture. But I really think the left's done a great job at finding these women that are um, disillusioned, that don't like the way they look, that are insecure like I was, that, um, that just don't have good role models and they get sucked into this. And it makes them feel good because they found their tribe, right? Like that's a big kind of, a, that was a big um, tool in these spiritual communities I was in. It's like, we're your family now. We're your chosen family. And I was like, no, my family is my family. You're my friends. And I choose to hang around with you because I like you, but let's not get it twisted. My family is my family, you know? And so um, they kind of separate you from any historical background from any cultural lineage and from any patriotic pride in nation, right? Like we are American, we should be proud. Sure, we have things to work on, but this is a great place to live. I've traveled all over the world. I'm always happy to come back here. Um, and, you know, when you instill a hatred for kind of yourself, it, it's easy to hate other people and project on the world. That's and I, that's what I see happening. I really see. I saw this video of um, I don't know if you saw this. I'm sure you did. The baby that was pulled straight from its mother and put on the chest of a transgender man. I saw that last night and was in. I have never been so enraged, upset, heartbroken. All of these emotions came flooding into me, and I, I, it was just like. What is going on? Because you felt that baby wanted yeah. its, it wanted its mother. It uh. didn't, and I don't understand how anyone <sighs> looks at that. Because yeah. That's okay. And the people that are looking at that and saying that's okay are mostly women. 